There are also morals in war. I won't read this whole thing. But there's, there's um, a law in Deuteronomy 21, it says, that if you go out and, and as a people of Israel and you attack another country and you see, and you, and you beat them, and you see a beautiful woman, you can bring her back home with you to be one of your wives. Notice that multiple wives are okay. And when you do this, though, you have to give her a month grieving period where she has to shave her hair, head, cut, you know, cut her fingernails and stuff like that. I don't know what that meant. I really haven't figured that one out yet. And, um, and give her time to grieve. But if after a year you don't like her, you do not get to sell her as a slave. You have to let her go free. So do we generally in the Geneva Convention say it's okay to go over to Iraq or Afghanistan and, and, and attack a village and take wives home? We don't. That We would consider that reprehensible. But their cultures didn't. But we still see in this text, as horrific as it is, a kind of leadership. Now I need to say right off the bat though, that there are other passages in the scripture which I can discern no good leadership whatsoever. Both in the Hebrew scripture and in the New Testament. They're just flat out morally reprehensible. Right off the bat. But there's also purity laws. And this is, the, the, this is in Leviticus 19. And notice how, how this sentence starts. You shall keep my statutes. In other words, this is a really big deal. Pay attention. You shall not let your animals breed with a different kind. You shall not sow your field with two different kinds of seed. Nor shall you put on a garment made of two different materials. I'd like you all to check your clothing tags right now. <laughs> okay? Why, it, why were they, they all... Uh, what was, what's going on here? In the Hebrew imagination about the world, God made the world for different kinds of things to go together, and some things don't. And things that don't belong are unclean. A snake was considered unclean. You know why? Because it has scales like a fish, but it lives on the land. Therefore, it is a thing out of place. Now, we all know there's nothing wrong with snakes. I don't like them. <laughs> Okay, we'll get to that, we'll get to that, uh, because that's part of purity, okay? We may not like them. There's a purity thing going on there, okay? So they had this very vivid imagination. Well, what were purity laws for? Purity laws are basically to describe objects or practices that a group deems to be icky. Oh, that's icky. We teach our kids. That's icky. That's what purity laws are. They're about what's icky. And what they do for a group is they help to identify who the insiders and outsiders are, and they help to maintain group cohesion. Because the people who are a part of us don't eat pigs. And the people who aren't, they eat pigs. Today I was at Subway getting a sandwich this afternoon, and I saw a guy with, with a Jewish keychain in his hand. And I stood up to the, to the, to the, the guy, the guy said, what, what do you want today? And I, and I was looking for the $5 foot long thing, and I was thinking about ordering ham, but the guy was Jewish ahead of me. So I thought I better not order ham. <laughs> and I know he wouldn't mind, but I just, I just thought of it, you know. So what, it, it maintains group cohesion. That's what it's for. In Deuteronomy 14, it says, All winged insects are unclean for you. They shall not be eaten. Right? All winged insects. I found these on the series of tubes that is the internet. And uh, this, this woman up here has these nice little little tubers up here. These little, I don't know, these little larvae sort of thing. And we have some more larvae over here. It looked like almost a Thai dish. I think there's some nice basil in that. <laughs> and then I found this picture of this girl eating a fried grasshopper. And, you know, it was okay with me at first until I realized, and maybe you guys can't see it, but there's only one tentacle on the grasshopper. The other one's gone. And as soon as I realized that that was, that was there, I got to thinking about tentacles. And I realized that I could never eat that. How many of you could eat, could eat what's up there on that screen? Okay, so about maybe, uh, you know, maybe 20% maybe something like that of, of us here could do that. <laughs> if you had enough garlic. Okay, yeah. <clears throat> Is there really technically anything wrong with eating bugs if they're prepared properly? Much of the world e eats bugs. And in fact, we'd be much better from a carbon emissions standpoint if we did. It takes a lot less carbon and energy to, to, to create bugs, uh, we, we have protein in bugs than it does a protein with a, a chicken or a cow. 
right? And yet I could not eat this. And in fact, if you were to sit down at a table with me and we were eating good Thai food and you ordered that dish, I would hurl. <laughs> I would. I would hurl. Okay? I would try to hurl, not on you, because I also know that that's unclean. All right? So um, purity, we have purity codes. They're, they're not as traditionally oriented as they were for the people of Israel, but they're still there. And they had them described very effectively and efficiently because they were trying to maintain their cohesion as a people in very, often very difficult circumstances. And so we can understand it, but we don't necessarily have to buy into everything there. So there are some biblical texts that talk about homosexuality, or appear to. Some of them don't really at all. One that is often talked about is Genesis 19, 1 through 11, where Lot and his family are in Sodom, and all the people in, the, in, the, in all the whole town come and knock on the door because Lot is now entertaining two men who are called angels. It probably just means messengers. And they want to come and, and, and rape them. Now that appears to many people who just read the scripture without looking at cultural context to be about homosexuality. It is not. That is a text about rape. And furthermore, if you look through scripture at the way Sodom and Gomorrah is referenced by prophets and other writers, you never see sexuality being an issue. That the key issue for Sodom and Gomorrah, as quoted in the rest of the scriptures, is about dominating other people, other nations around them, and about dominating the vulnerable in their society. And for them, homosexual rape, or rape of other people's women, was a way to um, really uh, put down and dominate another other people, to, to um, make that person less than human. And so Genesis 19, 1 through 11, is a powerful text. It's just not a powerful text about homosexuality at all. Okay? Then we get to the ones in Leviticus, Leviticus 18 and Leviticus 20. You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. The word abomination has to do with holy things, which, which helps us to understand that this text is not really about ethics or morals, that this text is about purity. And there's a whole lot of cultural details about men and women who had roles to do what in, in those cultures that I don't have time to go into here. But remember how I said purity laws are about what goes with what. Okay? From a, from a purity standpoint, from what we sense is icky. You can't have two kinds of fiber inside the same, the same garment. That's what's going on here. This is a purity law. Plain and simple. Some other biblical texts, I'm not showing all of them here today. This one's from Romans chapter 1. For this reason, God gave them up to unnatural passions. Their women exchanged natural intercourse for unnatural. And in the same way, also the men giving up natural intercourse with women were consumed with passion for one another. What we have in this text and the one that follows it, are, are, this is a moral writing. But it's a moral writing based on a purity law. There's also tremendous controversy about many of the Greek words in this text, as you may know. All the Hebrew scripture is written in Hebrew, and the Christian scripture is written in Greek. And those Greek words, if you listen to a conservative commentator on the scripture, those Greek words talking about unnatural or, or fornication or sodomites or male prostitutes, those are really broad words. And they apply to any interaction between men and men sexually. And if you talk to other biblical scholars who have just as many numbers behind their, their, uh, their, their name, as many letters behind their name, and love Jesus every bit as much, they look at the culture of the time and they say that these words were very narrowly used words to describe the relationship between men who were powerful and boys or other men who were not powerful and thus represent a dominating kind of sexual relationship. 